Okay, so now let's take this line by line. All right. This is Jude on the left. On the right is Peter. If we try to make the, you know, make them show side by side parallel, you got this verse four, which is tracking to this. Notice here he's saying condemnation written long ago, and have secretly slipped in versus will be. This is a sonte in the Greek, and it is a future tense. I'm trying to keep it simple because this is going to be a hard thing to slog through. They will secretly introduce themselves. Okay? And then at that time, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Here he's saying condemnation written about long ago. That's multi entendre because there's all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament about this. But he's also changing the tense. Now this is something that I, I don't see scholars, I'm sure they know about it, but I don't see them do much or I don't see the pulpits cover this much. When you're doing Bible, when you're studying Bible, you have to be very slow about it. Okay? You have to look for little changes. In Greek writing, they prided themselves on making little changes in well-known ideas or texts in order to make new points out of old information. That's what Jude is doing. So definitely we know that Jude is after Peter. Okay, He's playing on Peter the way the Lord played on Psalm 16. When the Lord, when or John played on Psalm 16, when John was writing up the discourse in the so-called Pericope Adulteria of John 8, 1 through 10, and I did videos showing how John patterned the way he wrote chapter 8, uh, the first 10 verses of chapter 8, on Psalm 16. Okay, so now Jude is patterning what he writes to Peter. So we got to be very slow and very careful about how we read Jude. First of all, condemnation long ago is contrasted with, on the right-hand side, bringing, future tense, swift destruction on themselves. In other words, the swift destruction that's going to happen was written about long ago. Yeah, in the Old Testament. Okay? That's one change of tense. He's, he's, he's tying to Peter backwards because he's writing later. How much later, I don't know. Bringing swift destruction on themselves. So Jude is saying, hi, you have now what Peter said was going to come true. It's true in your life right now. That's why I'm writing you. And their condemnation was written about long ago. Okay. But Peter was saying that their destruction is going to come on them. It was written about long ago, but it hadn't happened yet. So basically, if you're, if you're tracking to Peter the way Jude is, you know immediately that <coughs> the reason he's writing in such a hurry is that these teachers are coming in. Now, they're here. So the swift destruction that's going to happen to them is going to happen to anybody associated with them. In other words, be careful, get out. That's going to be the theme of Jude's letter. Be careful, get out, destruction is coming. All right? Peter was warning about that prophetically, and that was really important for Peter to do it because he's writing a deathbed letter. Deathbed letters are always going to have some prophecy in them. And so that's what Peter's doing, is he's giving you a deathbed letter with a prophecy of false teachers coming in. Okay? And so Jude, kind of akin to the way the book of Judges is justifying Psalm 90, Jude is writing his letter to say, Hi, the thing Peter prophesied on his deathbed is coming true. It's the teachers, the bad teachers are here now among you, 
and the swift destruction that's forecast by Peter to them is going to happen now to them because it was written long ago and that means you got to be careful not to associate with them okay sorry for the delay so that's why he's so strident in his letter okay when when you gotta warn people sometimes you have to be nasty and strident to even get their attention because we're all so wrapped up in our dry cleaning and Johnny needs a haircut we always listen with half an ear so he's got to use real strong language that's why he's doing it they are godless men that doesn't mean they're not saved in fact the rest of this verse is going to prove that they're saved they're godless men meaning that they're carnal they're without God okay you can be without God and be saved simply by being carnal okay now John's going to be talking back to this so now I'm more convinced that Jude is earlier at least earlier than John so sometime earlier than 90 okay they are godless men who change and this is how you know they're believers who change the grace of our God into a license from immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign Lord the whole epistle of 1st John is based on this so John is is basically validating Jude so now I have more more confidence that Jude really belongs exactly where it is and it's before 90 but after 64 or 66 maybe 10 years after but then I'm, I'm not sure it's that much after. That's still a problem I have to resolve. Okay? See, if they're changing the grace of God into licentiousness, what that means is they're using the fact that they're saved as a justification for whatever immorality they bring up. And that's going to be talked to in the book of Revelation when it's talking about Jezebel. All right? So John is elaborating on what Jude is talking about here. All right. People, I mean, Peter, looking at this, they follow their shameful ways, bring the way of truth and disrepute. They exploit you with their stories that they have made up. The condemnation, see, this Jude talking again, has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. So Jude is basically repeating, hi, what Peter told you is true now. That's the difference in Jude. And he's giving more detail. And then John will be talking to this in 1 John 2, uh, 2 John, 3 John, and in Revelation when he talks about the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitan just means conquerors of the people. It's not a denomination. Church fathers were just stupid. Okay, Nico means to conquer, and Leo, Lao means people. Okay, so they call themselves conquerors of the people. It's a, it's a neologism that the Lord makes up in um, uh, Revelation to try and explain that it's a, you know, a conglomerate group. It's not a specific denomination. Okay, Jezebel was one of them, saying, "Well, hi, if you're saved, you can do anything you want." Or whatever it was that she was, you know, promoting. I'm not sure. But it was something akin to that. Okay? And deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign Lord. So apparently there was some Gnosticism mixed in there. Or whatever it was. Okay? Though you already know all this. Now the, the trouble with this verse. And I, I almost I hesitate. I'll just explain it. You can look up the Greek text yourself. Although you already know all this. In some Greek texts, the word that's translated already here is the word hapax. Okay? Some Greek texts put it just after oidontas. Okay, for no. You already know. It means once with no need to repeat. Other texts put the word hapax once right here before the word delivered. Okay? It's actually, it says Lord, then once then people then delivered. It makes more sense to say the Lord once delivered his people out of Egypt because once he delivered them, there's no going back. Alright? 
Now, here's where Jude is going to differ in his order of presentation, yet cover the same points that Peter did. Because Peter starts at the beginning with the angels. And this, this has to do with um, Genesis 6. But instead of doing that, instead of going there next, which is in sequence, our boy Jude puts Egypt, okay? Because what he's trying to explain, because he, he's keying off the false teachers, in Egypt, and after Egypt, after they left, there were a lot of complainers who said they shouldn't have left Egypt, who were saying Moses shouldn't have been the leader. And so instead of comparing to angels next, like Peter's going to does in verse 4 on the right-hand side, Jude goes back to Egypt. Now, I think the reason he's doing this is because he's following the order in Hebrews 3. Okay? Um, because Hebrews 3 is talking about today, if you will yet believe, the Lord destroyed those who did not believe because after they got out of Egypt, they, did, they still didn't listen. Okay? So he's making an analogy probably to Hebrews 3, okay? Now, it could be instead that he's just setting up his point in this order, and Hebrews 3 is keying off Jude, and that's what I don't know, because this is, this, this is just a one-sentence statement, okay? And then he goes to the angels where Peter is on the right-hand side in verse 4, saying it differently, but, you know, talking about the same point. That's Genesis 6, the flood. So he's setting up a parallel between leaving Egypt to go to the promised land and the angels leaving their own estate and, you know, causing the flood. The 120 years prior to the flood was one of the worst periods in human history as far as violence goes. Okay, and that the Bible says that's because they were demon hybrids. That, that Noah and the, the, you know, the six his three kids and their wives and his wife were the only eight pure humans left and you know people will scoff at that but that's what the text says so I'm going with it but the writer in Jude Jude is making a parallel between going to the promised land and leaving the promised land okay the angels who who you know ended up going to um, to earth cohabiting with the women and they were bound in Tartars which Peter talks about already in 2nd Peter and 1st Peter alright so he's setting up a parallel here inserting it before Peter's talking about the angels that's a change so you have to be real careful when you read scripture why is he making this change because he's making a parallel of going from where you shouldn't be to where you should be to those who went where they should have been to where they shouldn't go. All right? And then the flood, more on the flood here. And Jude's going to pick up that point later in a different way. All right? So he skips that point in Peter and goes straight to the next point in Peter about Sodom and Gomorrah. All right? In other words, the whole theme here is warning then judgment warning then judgment okay that's what he's doing is he's setting up a parallel of different times in history when there was warning then judgment but he starts it with Egypt then he goes to the angels doesn't say much and then he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah again tracking the Peter so he's changing the order when you're changing the order of something, and this is what the gospel writers also do, when you change the order, you want the, the reader to sort of like reorganize the same information to see a different perspective that the same information offers. Here the different perspective is the chosen people being given the promise still rejected the promise they were given just as these guys are rejecting the promise they were given, 
to turn the promise into a license for immorality. And that's exactly what the people in Egypt did. They no sooner get out of Egypt when they melt down all their gold and start worshiping that bull that Aaron created for them. Okay, he's drawing parallel to that, which helps us know what kind of immorality is being talked about here. You see the point? So he's being real specific. The reader who's getting this is going to be able to say, oh yeah, I get that. This is all one unit. Okay? And then he goes back to the angels who are also doing the whole copulation thing in, in Genesis 6. So he's drawing an analogy between the current immorality he's warning about, the immorality that when they got out of Egypt that they got into, and the immorality of the angels taking on human women and cohabiting with them. Okay? Because he's talking to a current audience. He's explaining what immorality means here. All right? And then he continues with that. Now he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah, which is already highlighted on the right. That's another example of immorality. Okay? And by the way, we're not talking about consensual sex here. We're talking about raping. Okay? We're talking about using, you know, the, the whole God thing, okay, I'm free, I'm saved, anything I do now is okay. This was especially a problem in Corinth. Um, he's, he's talking about whole-scale orgies here, and it was very popular in Roman culture, especially in Corinth. All right, so he's talking about a certain particular kind of abuse of the freedom of already being saved that's going on, okay? In the very same way, see, now he's coming back full circle to this sentence. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. Okay? And so he's skipping over the example of Lot in the Sodom and Gomorrah analogy because he expects the reader to already know this. Okay? But now he's coming back and tying back again to Peter here. In other words, he's showing how the Peter passage applies today at the time he's writing, and he's bringing in other analogies to further elaborate on what he means by immorality and have secretly slipped in among you. We have the same problem in Christianity today. There are Christian sects who, you know, play these kinds of games. They aren't often and they aren't many, but they do exist. And one of the flagrant groups among them are the Pentecostals and the Soakers and all these people who are trying to claim to be, you know, I've got a revelation from Christ, come join my cult, and then I'm going to have sex with all the little girls that believe that I'm the, the latest, you know, prophet. I mean, because that happens. Jim Jones, David Koresh. I mean, you know, we have modern examples of this stuff. Okay? So he does the Sodom and Gomorrah thing. Then he's celestial beings. Now he's tying back to Peter, so you know where he's referring to in Peter. Okay? And then, in order to elaborate on this, in Peter, he adds this ex nihilo okay he must be getting that directly from God okay so what is this with slandering celestial beings because the point is is that the archangel Michael is so obedient to God that he won't he won't even you know fight Satan he'll just say the Lord rebuke you so these dreamers are slandering what Michael wouldn't do Okay, so he's elaborating on what Peter is saying here. Okay? He's elaborating on it. He's elaborating on Peter. Okay, and here's the elaboration. So he had to get that directly from God. Okay, in other words, the assumption of Moses was a corruption of what people probably did know anciently about this particular event. 
but it wasn't recorded in canon until now. Okay? And then he resumes talking again the same way Peter does right here. Okay, and that's here in Peter. See? There you go. All right? So you see, he's changing the order to explain what's current, to tie the scripture to what's currently happening to them. All right? And he's basically saying that they're acting like animals. All right? But he had inserted extra detail here. That what even the angels won't do, these false teachers are doing. Okay? And I'm going to end this increment now because I'm afraid my... Um, uh, recorder is going to go wacko on me. Okay? Coming back.